the 14th Regiment of Unmanned Systems of the Ukrainian Armed Forces, known as Tahi Madia has begun using fiber optic FPV drones on the battlefield. The unit commander Robert Brovdi, under the call sign Madia, published footage of the UAV's combat work on his Telegram channel. The fiber optic drone was developed by the engineering service Tahi Madia. It has already been tested on the battlefield. It was successfully able to destroy an enemy tank that was firing at the Ukrainian Armed Forces position. There is a lot of talk about plans to use fiber optics on FPV drones. Like, the occupiers are increasing their use and the Ukrainian armed forces are only testing them. Not all. We are using them, said Madia. He named two main advantages of drones of this type. The first is the transmission of video without loss of quality. The second is invulnerability to enemy electronic warfare systems. A regular drone doesn't have a chance. The electronic warfare is working, the commander noted. He specified that the development was transferred to the highest military leadership, which launched the process of industrial production of the new UAV. Earlier, media reported that the Ukrainian armed forces spoke about the advantages of the new fiber optic drone. Kiev has completed the testing phase of a new fiber optic drone from the Black Widow Web 10 project. The press service of the general staff of the armed forces of Ukraine reported this. The new type of drone can fly up to 5 kilometers and carry ammunition weighing up to 2 kilograms. It will not be just one drone, but a whole line that has already received NATO codes. The main innovation of the drone is overcoming enemy electronic warfare systems. Moreover, the new drone is on fiber optics, which will make it possible to use the same technology on FPV drones in the future. Back in March 2024, the media reported that work on creating fiber optic drones was in full swing in Ukraine. At that time, they were talking about the Banderik Strelka drone, which could stay in the air for about 15 minutes and carry ammunition weighing up to 3 kilograms. Putin's army is actively using fiber optic drones in the Kursk region. The Russian Federation transferred about 2,000 tracked howitzers to Ukraine and over the 34 months of the war, the occupiers lost at least 800 of them. As Forbes writes, the production of new howitzers is currently lagging significantly behind demand. The once huge stockpiles of old howitzers from the Soviet era have been reduced, perhaps by half. Against the backdrop of a shortage of mobile artillery in the Russian Federation, North Korea has handed over its howitzers to the occupiers for the second time in six weeks. They were spotted moving by train. The publication notes that this does not so much demonstrate close relations between the countries as it shows the dependence of the Russians on North Korean weapons. As is known, the M1989 howitzers fire 170mm shells, which is an unusual caliber. As Estonian analyst Artur Rehi explains, most Russian guns fire 122mm or 152mm shells. North Korea has sent potentially millions of these shells to Russia so that the invaders could potentially fire more than 10,000 shots a day. Until this winter, North Korea supplied artillery ammunition of the calibers that Russia can produce itself. It is indicated that the Russians' problem was production capacity, not ability. That is, if Pyongyang turns its back on Moscow, the Russians will not lose artillery, they will just use it less often. Now, with the arrival of the M1989, the situation is changing. This self-propelled gun is the only 170mm howitzer in the world. Therefore, it is quite possible that all the factories that produce shells for it are located in North Korea. This further deepens Russia's dependence. More than a year ago, Ukrainian analytical group Frontelligence Insight reported on the first million North Korean shells that had arrived in Russia. The question then arose as to what exactly the DPRK had received in return. Moscow is likely to transfer missile and submarine technology to Pyongyang, potentially accelerating the North Korean Navy's long-term efforts to develop and deploy quite quiet submarines armed with nuclear weapons or intercontinental ballistic missiles, according to U.S. Navy Admiral Samuel Paparo, head of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. It's a one-sided trade that largely favors the North Koreans. The Russians get artillery. The North Koreans could get underwater nuclear weapons. But what choice does Russia have as its depleted artillery corps becomes increasingly North Korean?
If Pyongyang doesn't get what it wants, it could effectively turn off an increasing share of Moscow's biggest weapons, the publication concluded. Russia deployed a North Korean core to Russia's Kursk region over the weekend, two months after deploying them to its territory. But North Korean troops are picking up bad habits from their Russian counterparts, writes columnist David Axe for The Telegraph. From North Korea, it was a learning opportunity. The Democratic People's Republic of Korea's army has not fought a major land war in seven decades. Yet, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un expects it to be able to defeat the extremely well-equipped South Korean army if tensions in the North Korean demilitarized zone ever escalate into open war. Russia's war against Ukraine is precisely the school for North Korea where the lessons of 21st century war are taught. The lessons are cruel and bloody, the author emphasizes. In 34 months of grueling war, the Russians have learned to trade huge amounts of human life for additional territorial gains. It's a terrible strategy, but not necessarily ineffective. The big question for the North Koreans is whether this approach would work in a ground war 4,700 miles away on the Korean peninsula. Axe continued. Russia lost thousands of armored vehicles in its war against Ukraine, so it was forced to change tactics. Mechanized attacks with large numbers of vehicles became a rarity. They were replaced by infantry assaults. Ukrainian think tank Frontelligence Insight says Russian forces are now probing Ukrainian defenses by sending in one to two soldiers. When they find a weak spot, these soldiers signal the need for more reinforcements, often a platoon or company. Moscow can afford to lose these small units daily because the constant influx of new soldiers ensures that the pressure never lets up. For the Kremlin, people are still a cheap resource despite the huge losses in the war against Ukraine. Its soldiers are also a cheap resource for North Korea, at least for now. The other day, North Korean infantry attacked Ukrainian positions on foot, copying Russian tactics. North Korean forces suffered losses. Whether such bloody tactics could work in the demilitarized zone between South and North is an open question. But there are several important differences between the war in Ukraine and the possible conflict on the Korean peninsula. First, the Russians have a huge manpower advantage in Ukraine, and Ukrainian defenders often struggle with shortages of critical ammunition, especially artillery shells. Perhaps most critically, the Russian air component is dominant. Along the demilitarized zone on the Korean peninsula, North Korea outnumbers its neighbor, but only by a 2 to 1 ratio. South Korea's forces, with their extensive and sophisticated weapons industry, are unlikely to run short of ammunition. And South Korea's state-of-the-art air force is vastly superior to North Korea's aging air force. By joining the war against Ukraine, the North Korean army is learning important lessons. But are they the right ones? And when the surviving fighters of the DPRK Corps in Kursk return home and teach their peers the tactics of attrition? Will they condemn those peers to die in senseless attacks against large, well-armed South Korean troops? We won't know until North Korea invades through the DMZ. But anyone expecting this war to be like the war in Ukraine is likely to be shocked, David Axe said. 